for years, SpyCast has brought you the most interesting stories from the world of intelligence. Stories of spies and surveillance, disinformation, deception, propaganda and covert action. And today's SpyCast is no different. Well, it's a little different. I'm Dr. Vince Houghton, the historian and curator for the International Spy Museum. And the subject of today's podcast is not foreign intelligence or global espionage. Instead, it's American election politics. Now, what do American election politics have to do with intelligence? Well, it turns out, a lot. American elections have begun to take on many of the same characteristics and tradecraft as modern intelligence agencies. And the trend suggests this will become more and more common in the years ahead. So I wanted to know more. So I sat down with NBC News' Chuck Todd to see what he had to say on this important issue. Our guest today is political director and chief White House correspondent for NBC News, Chuck Todd. He is also the host of The Daily Rundown, which airs every weekday on MSNBC from 9 to 10 a.m. He is also a political correspondent for The Today Show, for NBC News with Brian Williams, and for Meet the Press. Chuck Todd, thank you for coming to the International Spy Museum. You got it. Great place to be to talk politics. Absolutely. All right. Um, so I've noticed a trend, uh, certainly in the last several election cycles, mm -hmm. where campaigns have been using spy tradecraft for right. things that normally are uh, in the purview of intelligence agencies in order to win campaigns. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's several of these that I want to talk to you about today. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest one and the one most people might know about is this idea of tracking yep. and tracking candidates. Right. Uh, immediately I thought when I, when I was thinking about this of the Makaka incident. Well, it's the most infamous, ago. right, and, it, and it's that one. And um, What's interesting about it, it is this was out in, the, out in the plain view. The campaign and of course what made it so infamous is George Allen knew the guy. The web campaign was paying for the staffer to follow him around. This was not somebody sneaking into a fundraiser like the famous, the infamous 47% right. remark with Mitt Romney. This was totally out in the open because it is something that campaigns, particularly in 06, were just starting to do. Uh, and, uh, and, and pretty much all of them were doing it. Uh, it just was, this was, it used to be that, for instance, you'd only track a candidate a couple of times. You know, you didn't have the resources, you didn't have the money, obviously the expense of, of the video and who was going to watch it all. In this case, 06 really was the cycle that you started to see. It became a, a, a tool of every campaign. And then, of course, uh, the Jim Webb campaign struck cold. Uh, and what, you know, and you literally had George Allen staring in and he was telling, and, and that used to be some of the things that candidates used to do, say, hey, look, hey, there's my opponents. Tra they're tracking me on the campaign. They used to, you know, make have it fun of it, almost to try to Number one, you try to embarrass the guy. Right. You hope that they feel uncomfortable. Um, but of course, he makes that moment. I mean, it, it's, an, it's a young man, an Indian American, that he refers to as Makaka, an old, uh, an old, uh, an old phrase that was uh, uh, viewed by some as uh, as derogatory. And I think from that moment on, every campaign realized this isn't an optional thing you do. This is something you have to do. Well, now even political action committees or PACs are getting involved. Within the, oh, they're doing it spending. more. That's yeah. right. There's unlimited amount of money, and in some ways, they've actually taken and taken it over. They've done more of it. And the, by the way, it's not just following them around the campaign trail. Now it is that next step. You're trying to sneak into donor events. You're trying to see if you can sneak a videotape in. You have some Democratic operatives trying to get into Koch brothers' political events and things like that. So it's uh, and then you try to record and capture in just the same way you would do in intelligence. Every utterance that the candidate makes, whether it's on radio, whether it's on the internet, whether it's on uh, other, you know, this is how the Todd Aiken thing, it was a small affiliate, right. a Fox affiliate that nobody was really tracking, nobody saw it, but it was because the campaign went and uh, made sure they knew every movement the other candidate was making, the McCaskill campaign in this case, and then they took that video and spread it like wildfire. There's a great story from last week, really, mm -hmm. from Michigan, right. where the Michigan GOP got themselves in some hot waters. It turned out they were sneaking into private events, right. 
with their trackers wearing spy glasses or, or glass. I mean, that's, that's straight out of a spy movie. Well, that's taking it to another right. level. And this is where there's a fine line. There's sort of an accepted trade craft, and then there's that level of where you're pushing the envelope. And I have to say, I, I have a um, concern that because of the nature of this, you know, we, we've the coarsening rhetoric and the feeling where there's such a case of delegitimizing the other side that winning and losing a political campaign is viewed by some supporters as life and death. And if you view something as life or death, then you will do stupid things. Right. You will take risks. Um, does that mean uh, taking a risk like something like this, which is frankly illegal. Let's look at the case of Mississippi, uh, the Mississippi Senate race down there a couple months ago where somebody essentially wanted to get picked, prove that Dad Cochran was somehow uh, not taking care of his sick wife. Right. So they snuck into the her. Uh, nursing uh, nursing home. So it is, I am concerned that because it's now where there's too many um, amateur political operatives who think it's time to take action in my own hands and they think, well, the technology's there, why don't we try to do it using spy glasses or Google right. glasses or something like that. Well, I mean, later on in the interview, I was going to ask you about this, but since you just brought it up, it, it really, the, this is the democratization of this political process. I think so, and it is the idea that, I mean, if you look at 47%, right, and it made in this case, I think it was Jimmy Carter's grandson, right? Famous, and right. the kid, the guy who had it. So I think there's all these people that think they're going to be the next guy in some ways. You, you hate to say it, that they're going to be the ones to expose, uh, you know, be able to be the turning point for their candidate or for their cause. So I think it is encouraging greater risk. And frankly, like I said, taking may, it, it already to people political campaigning is sort of disgusting, right. uh, all the, uh, the way it's done. It could take it to another level where it really turns off voters. So it's kind of fun to talk about in the spying sense. It's, right. yeah. it's more than kind of bad for democracy. A, it is bad for democracy. It's a bad trend moving yes, forward. Um, it is. This is only getting you know, more and more. No, because the technology makes it easier. Right. That's what we're talking about here. Technology has been enabling this. And again, winning or losing is so important in the moment in time, so there's, that's the rationalization. We should be talking about whether it's moral, morally or right. ethically good. Well, and with social media, you have the, the uh, in the Romney campaign, forget the 47%, of course, that was the mm -hmm. penultimate moment of that. But there was the time where he was asked about speaking fees. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I didn't really make that much money. Mm -hmm. And it turned out somebody already had the figures. He made over $300,000. Right. Because of social media, yeah. it was tweeted out immediately sure. by the DNC. And it got out. Mm -hmm. You know, No one would have known about it, perhaps, other than a small local group. Mm -hmm. And because of social media, technology becomes a national story. Well, you know, what's funny about it is I actually think this trend of tracking the candidates, here's the unintended consequence. If you think candidates say nothing now when they're on TV doing interviews with me or other journalists where they try so hard to stick to their talking points and not answer any question that offends anybody, now it used to be in small groups you might get them to be honest, maybe at a fundraiser they'd be honest. And I think now we're going to get to the point where you know, you're going to have such plastic and clinical and sterile candidates and then the voters are going to say, man, are these people even human beings? They're almost yeah. robotic in every part of their uh, of their campaigning. I mean, that's the only real available countermeasures to this intelligence gathering. It is. To, it, it, to clam up. And it is, and that's wrong for democracy. Yeah. So again, I, you know, it's there. Again, I, it is interesting, it is intriguing, and it is debilitating right. to the political, right. <laughs> to the political process. Well, tracking is one of a broader umbrella of opposition mm -hmm. research, or OPPO, right. and I wanted to talk about that separately because right. tracking is its own little family there, mm -hmm. and opposition research has some elements to it that I think are interesting, especially how far back it goes. Um, in some of the research that I've done, opposition research has been around since the very beginning. Of course. The, hey, Ma, know, but one of the famous old, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Okay, that had to do with a presidential candidate in the, in the 19th century. Right. John Walsh is the story yeah. now, and it turns out that he possibly plagiarized his master's thesis. Oh, he admitted that the plagiarism. Uh, admitted the no, plagiarism. He admitted that there was some plagiarism there, that the, that the accusations are true. And the, the only way sloppy. that would have been discovered is if, in this case, his opposition had been keeping records and paying attention to what he had done and what he had written and, and what in the past. Well, look, the key to it, so for instance, let's think about what opposition research, what its main goal is, right? So number one, you hope, you know, everybody thinks, oh my God, I'm going to do it out and maybe I'll find a smoking. Maybe they're not who they say they are in some like obvious way. But the real goal now of opposition research is because for the most part, 
somebody doesn't get recruited to run by one party without them doing their own due diligence. Everybody's doing this. So then the key to opposition research is a much more a finite uh, job, which is can you find something that undoes their strength, that, may, that can somehow uh, go into contrast with who they say they are. So in the case of John Walsh, here's a guy who's running on his military record, basically saying, I'm not much of a politician, I just got into politics, I had a career in the military, and here I am. And so then you, so if you're an, you, you pick and choose, like, what are you going to go see? So this is a case where the Republicans said, okay, let's take a look at his military background. Is there something here? Maybe they got a tip. They probably did, because why would you take his thesis and then do that? He obviously, somebody tipped them off that something was funny here. Uh, and then they went through uh, and were able to match it up. Uh, and it's, look, this is, you can't imagine uh, a, a journalist doing this on their own right. because it's a lot of time on, on a race that wasn't really on the radar screen. So this is a case where you have the feeling that it came from some sort of operative world or at least the tip came from operative world because they had maybe done some of the due diligence. And a good reporter, even if you get opposition, right, a lot of investigative reporters deal with opposition researchers on both sides. But a good reporter checks it on their own. Mm -hmm. And you know, Times clearly did all the work right. themselves. You redo the work in some cases. Whatever it is, you do it yourself um, because you, you're not sure if somebody's playing fast and loose with you with the oppo dump that they're doing. But in this case, it's clearly the line of research was, okay, these are his strengths. Let's see if we can pick apart right. their strengths. And, uh, and that's what they were able to successfully do. And for presidential elections, they, the, they compile research books that are hundreds of pages mm -hmm. long uh, in many cases, they're looking to see if there are inconsistencies in messaging. Is yeah, it? sometimes it's small. And you know, what's interesting about opposition research in the way it's moved over time, and this is the case with social media, and so it's a, a version of intelligence, is that so these things have been going on, as you said, for decades, okay? But what the job of a researcher was is, okay, you do all this research and you pick and choose, well, what are the two or three we're going to be able to, to, to actually use? What are the two or three that are... You know, that either you try to get it reported on and then turn it into a TV ad or whatever it is you're trying to do. Now, even the bad research gets out because in social media, let's say you can't get a mainstream news organization to buy some crappy research. But now you can find some partisan news organization right. that's carrying your water left or right to take the small dribs and drabs. So now everything comes out eventually now. It's not just the big stuff about people, but the small stuff about people, which all, by the way, another unintended consequence of that, it's gonna lead to fewer dynamic people running for office, because right. we're only gonna have the shut-ins who will run, who have never lived right. as humans. Uh, I wasn't gonna ask about this because we're dealing with domestic politics, but <clears throat> kind of going off of the vein of what you just brought up, talking about certain news organizations picking up stories that are somewhat sketchy. Uh, the right. story of Bob Menendez in right. New Jersey. Uh, that was a big story here, of course, because mm -hmm. the Cuban intelligence seems to have had a hand in creating the story about... Look, I am holding <laughs> off judgment on that. Growing up, you and I both grew up in Miami. Miami yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> There are plenty of elected officials in Miami who use the Castro did it defense. Oh, sure. So I have to say, I look, I, I'm just saying this is, I understand his allegation. I understand with the Justice Department. Sometimes, why don't you let the authorities get the work done? Yeah, and, and I, I would be very, it is, is it true that some international government, does the United States mess around in other people's politics? Yes, we've been caught doing that for years, for decades. Um, is it a case where it's vice versa sometimes? There's no doubt. Uh, this was a pretty convenient charge, and again, like I said, yeah. I have a I have a more skeptical feeling about this because you grew up. Many a Cuban politician in Miami has blamed Castro for their own yeah. unethical behavior. Uh, sorry to our our viewers from yeah. Miami, our listeners. Yes. Uh, we come from arguably the most corrupt city in the well, northern the county. Heights. No, it's very frustrating. <laughs> I mean, because here's this great um, uh, international city. And the, the way, as you know, the politics of the county is set up, the county's pretty, pretty un, uncorrupt, but there's so many municipalities within Miami-Dade County, and they're basically, I think now we're up to 31 municipalities. They used to be 27. I, I, know, I know it, I think like Pinecrest, right. probably where you Palmetto grew up, Bay, Bay, it's all of it, right? All these things. And they're little fiefdoms now, and, they're, and they're, each one of them uh, has become corruptible, and some of them are highly corrupt. Hylia has had problems for years, right. for instance. And they're, they're just little political fiefdoms that, that sort of 
give local politics a bad name. Well, we could talk about this yes. forever, but let's <laughs> let's let's get back on topic. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what in the intelligence world we talk about as gray propaganda. Mm -hmm. In this case, creating disinformation campaigns mm -hmm. and uh, trying to make it to where it's not attributable to your mm -hmm. campaign. And, and to me, the most uh, interesting, if not famous, case of this was in the 2000 Republican primary in South Carolina, where potentially Karl Rove, but certainly somebody within the Bush campaign, leaked a false story about John McCain having an illegitimate African American baby. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you talk a little bit about? Well, it's funny. Ideas? It's sort of like, and what's the what, what was the you know like like every piece of propaganda? What's the grain of right. truth that they get into? Um, okay, he had, I believe, a Bangladeshi child, adoptive yeah, child that Cindy McCain had rescued and adopted. Right, and, uh, rescued and adopted. So uh, this was certainly not a white child. Um, this was a Bangladeshi child. So there was a. My God! Look, there's the photo of right. McCain with this with a child that doesn't look like John McCain. They don't have the same skin color, so that was the grainy truth. And then it, and it goes from there. Look at South Carolina's infamous for politics like this. But you know, this is the whole. When did you stop? You know, it's the, the famous Linda John. When did you stop beating your right. wife? You know, type of campaigning. And we're seeing it. You know, in many ways, most campaigns now are fought on some level of what you just described as, what do you, what do you call it here, gray? Gray propaganda. propaganda gray propaganda, at. where it's sort of, right, I mean, let's look at it just on, on a basic issue. Democrats are trying to claim that all Republicans don't. So when they say that Republicans are against uh, specific forms of contraception, they might leave out the phrase specific forms. Right. They want to make it so that, re oh, Republicans are against birth control. All right, they're against, some of these candidates are against two types of, that's a form, you could argue, of gray propaganda, right? They're trying to leave the impression of some broad, I mean, it, that's the nature of the way political ads now right. are, are put together by both parties. So I think that that is unfortunately standard practice, yeah. this idea of gray propaganda. You know, yes, this is the, this is the seedier underbelly. I mean, I, I, a more recent example, uh, when you were just talking about McCain, um, how about the, uh, the, the uh, the way politicians, some Republicans, were trying to talk about the president's religion, right. when they would say things like, "Well, the president says he's a Christian. I take him at his word." Right. Is that is that actually supporting the president? Of course, the president's a Christian. Or is that trying to right. plant a seed of doubt by the way you word it? That you could argue is great propaganda. Well, John McCain yesterday said, "We don't have the votes for impeachment." Didn't say. There's nothing we can impeach the president. That's right. For. He wanted to leave yeah, it out there that out, we yeah. know some of you wish we could impeach, but we can't do it. Right. right. It's a, a it's another way of. And then flashing the picture of Barack Obama in Indonesia when he was younger with the, the guard talking about religion. Um, let, let's shift the, to something uh, that most people will know about. Mm -hmm. but we're going to put it in the broader umbrella of covert operations. Mm -hmm. This is a, a key component to intelligence operations around the world, mm -hmm. and it's found its way into the political world. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly Watergate is the best example sure. of covert operations. But even in that same campaign year, the Edwin Muskie covert op, I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with this or not, um, where potentially, uh, or at least according to the New York Times, an article that came out at the time, uh, the Nixon campaign infiltrated people right. into the Muskie campaign because the idea was they'd rather have McGovern sure. win the that primary. And so Creep, which is the committee to reelect the president, Richard Nixon, um, put operatives into the Muskie campaign to spy on the campaign. Is it? Oh, and it, well, it took, look, there's an accusation out there. I did some, I did some Watergate retrospectives a couple of years ago during the 40th anniversary of the, of the burglary itself. Where one of so one of the li one of the living Democratic operatives that were still around, whose phone was tapped, to this day swears that Nixon cut a deal with the governor of Texas, who happened to be a Democratic governor, John Conley, who happened to eventually serve in the Nixon administration as a cabinet member, eventually would switch parties and become a Republican, magically came up with the perfect amount of delegates on behalf of McGovern to prevent what was the DNC was trying to do at the time. Because my whole question to him is, why did they tap your phones? What is it? What was a piece of intelligence that they wanted to get? And what the Democratic Party was working on was they wanted to make sure nobody had a majority. They wanted a brokered convention. And he was at the time working for Terry Sanford, who was the governor of North Carolina. And it was a trying to get a different candidate. It was a Stop McGovern movement. Mm -hmm. The DNC was totally, the quote unquote establishment was in the midst of a Stop McGovern movement. And he says that's the piece of intelligence that they used to then 
go to their ally, in this case, you talk about infiltrating Muskie, and you know, there was definitely evidence of that. This is something that's never been fully proven. Woodward and Bernstein never put it in any of their books. And his, this guy told me that he went to Conley. And, and the thing is, the facts bear out. Conley did provide, magically, of all places, how did Texas end up giving delegates to McGovern? It right. didn't make sense at the time. Um, enough to get him so to prevent this. They were hoping to have just enough unaffiliated delegates to create this opportunity for a brokered convention. So he said that's the piece of intelligence mm -hmm. they picked up that became operable, as far as that's concerned. Um, that's what was so amazing and elaborate about what Nixon was right. up to. This was, this was everybody. This was not about beating McGovern. This was. It went back much farther. Like Watergate was sort of the tail end of this thing. This was about. Because here's the other part. They went back to bug it. They had successfully bugged a phone earlier, and that's what people don't realize. It was about creating chaos in the Democratic that's Party right. more than anything else. It is, and making sure that they had the weakest candidate. Or that you could create, make it harder for the party to unite, and they did both. There's a story um, from June of this year mm -hmm. uh, about the uh, the current governor of New Mexico, Susana mm -hmm. Martinez, um, and her former campaign manager right. just pled guilty to hacking her campaign right. uh, using you know cyber operations right. to pull guarded information, protected information from the campaign, and give it to her political opponents. Right. Um, is this the next phase of this this idea of intelligence and politics? Well, the whole cyber intelligence thing that's go going. I mean, you know, so so first of all, you have misinformation campaigns that are done on a cyber level. So you have people squatting on website names, and you know that sort of basic campaign campaign. You know, we look at it now, and you're like, well, of course, other candidates are going to do that, but that's a form of propaganda, of sort of intel propaganda that you would. So it's cyber squatting. But yes, I think you see more and more attempts to sort of break in. Look, we just had a, uh, this week, Michelle Nunn's campaign in Georgia saw her entire strategy memos, early strategy memos from a political consultant end up in the hands of a conservative journalist at a conservative news organization. And there it is, plain to see. Not a pretty picture. It's right. sort of the seamy under, like I say, the seamy underbelly of what modern campaigns are like. And there but for the grace of God go any candidate running for office, D or R, yeah. because they all have memos like this. I'll be curious to see, how did this memo leak out? Was this a case of somebody, did somebody steal the memos? Is there somebody, is there a, somebody leak them? Did somebody spy? I mean, I go back, you, you bring up, you brought up 2000, you know, there was another infamous incident in 2000 when, it, when magically uh, at the Gore campaign received a copy of George W. Bush's debate prep tape. Now, they decided they didn't want any part of this and they reported it immediately, never opened it, and it turned out that somebody in, uh, in one of the Bush consultant's offices was secretly trying to help Al Gore and <laughs> thought this was a good idea. So, look, I think that that's, a lot of times it is, you're vulnerable because you have a political enemy within your midst, right? Somebody that either you've made mad and they want to exact revenge, so in this case in New Mexico it was, I'll hack in and I can take this stuff and give it to an opponent, or sometimes it's somebody who's just blatantly leaking information to right. do damage. Well, I had read both both the Romney and the Obama campaigns in the 2012 election, hired a handful or more mm -hmm. of computer specialists to protect their networks right. because if so much money is now involved in presidential politics. It's a multi-billion dollar operation. What, yeah. what major corporation wouldn't have this? Right, well, I mean, the fear so. was at the time was uh, that a dedicated hacker could shut down their websites. That's right. And if you did that near the election, every hour they raised something like $150,000 to $200,000. So if it's down for a day, you're right. talking millions of dollars well, lost. Let me, let me take it to another level. You know, in 08, both McCain and Obama's uh, uh, websites were uh, email the email uh, servers were hacked by the Chinese. All right. Okay, so this was it, this was this was serious business. And in this case, the two campaigns worked together. They turned it over to national security. We never found out about it actually in the in the public until after the fact. But it turned out this was all part of the elaborate effort by the Chinese espionage community mm -hmm. to infiltrate um, to infiltrate our politics in some in one way or the other. No, they didn't. They just they wanted. They were trying to get information from whoever the next president was going to be. Yeah, and I can imagine that information falling in the hands of a political opponent would be. Well, it's know, one thing falling in the hands of a political opponent. How about right. falling in the hands of the Chinese? Chinese. I mean, let's yeah. you know suddenly we're upping it to another level right. here as far as uh, the the security of the United States is concerned. Absolutely, I, and I also read in the same cyber vein 
um, that the Lieberman campaign, uh, when he ran against that Ned Lamont, and yeah. eventually had to become an independent, right. um, said that Lamont had hacked into uh, the, the Lieberman campaign website, and that led to his defeat in the Democratic Party. Well, look, this is what goes back. I go back to something I talked about earlier, which is I think you know as you as you we are seeing more of this and we say campaign hacked and that's the accusation. What it really is is I, I, I'm, I'm going back to there are rogue elements on campaigns who think they're going to be the hero and because they have the ability to do it, they do it. And again, I think it's, it's going to contribute to making the political campaign process less, uh, less open to the public, less democratic. You're going to have candidates being less um, uh, comfortable speaking, we're going to lead to candidates that are, aren't going to be very interesting or unique, have unique experiences because they're afraid of what they're, what an opposition researcher might do to them. And so all of this is unhealthy for what's going on. But in that case, I mean, I believe it wasn't really officially the campaign. It was a rogue right. supporter who so, and again, because we're creating this, making campaigns seem like life or death, you rationalize unethical behavior because that's unethical behavior. Right. There's got to be some standards here. and. In, 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 in politics, there really is no, there's no line. And you know, we overlook it. We almost, I think this is us in the media too much. We make it seem like, oh, it's just politics. Right. It's, that's what they do. You know what? It sh we shouldn't be that way. I, I kind of hope we prosecute on this stuff. I yep. kind of like to see campaigns. It's just sort of like, no, let's put an end to this kind of shenanigan. Well, what's interesting from my perspective is that intelligence agencies when the United States intelligence agencies go overseas and do this stuff, mm -hmm. they know they're breaking the law overseas. That's right. I mean, that's really their mission statement is to go to recruit people to break laws inside the countries they go to. And that's nothing we shy away from. That's what we it's say. It's not, but it, it's sort but of like- But we're doing it here- I know, yeah. well then of course, look, there's an ethical and moral question of how we're doing it overseas. Right. You, you say, you know, we're doing that. Obviously we are doing that. Should we be doing that? Is this the right thing to do? Right. You know, I think these are, What's been fascinating about the disclosures of Edward Snowden, the disclosures in WikiLeaks, I think in general, is that it is opening up this debate about, you know, should we know more? You know, should the country right. be more honest in how it gathers intelligence and more honest in, on the intelligence that it finds and shares it with the public? Should that be extended to our political candidates also? That's, should we know more about our political candidates? Should, what, is this information? We know plenty about them. I don't think that's the issue. I think it's... Um, Look, I, I think you want people to win fair and square. I think this nefarious nature, I don't know. Look, I think the tracking is fair game. What you're doing in public, when you're publicly campaigning, there's sort of like, we know it's fair game. I think there is sort of like, there are lines that get crossed. Should you be breaking, you know, should private, what's wrong with having a private memo? Right. And a private memo should be a private memo. I think tracking, that's fair game. They're campaigning. What they say on the campaign trail is for the public record. That's how they're campaigning it, and, and in some ways, you are making, and this is where it's been a good thing. It used to be a politician, literally in a large state like Florida in the 70s and 80s. They could go to North Florida, start dropping their G's, right? Mm -hmm. Speaking with a little more Southern accent, you know, Florida, the, the farther north you go, the farther south you get. Um, and you could make some promises up there that people in South Florida wouldn't hear. Right. And then you can go to South Florida and say the same thing. The, this has been, I think, an upside. What's the positive side of technology and tracking? It is a force politicians to be more consistent in what they promise and say, so they're not. We can now catch them if they're saying one thing down here to an audience and saying another to an audience down there. Is it fair to blame, like we blame for most of the other problems in politics? Is it fair to blame money for these changes? Is I, it look? I think it's. I go to the life or death aspect. I think that we have we have created this atmosphere where. Um, Look, it's not just, uh, the atmosphere's been there for a long time in some races, but we, I think it's become of, you know, lose it when we have double the amount of people now who say the other party is against America's interests. Like, it's beyond sort of, I don't agree with them. It's, you know, we can all be pro-America, we just have a different way of becoming pro-America. That's not the debate anymore. So I do think that that, that has led to rationalizing rogue elements inside campaigns. Um, and I think, look, I don't think it's, look, money, money's always gonna be there. I mean, you, you, money's easy to blame, but it's not really the blame. The blame, look, the candidates should wanna win fair and square. And when you de-Americanized candidates, I, I just made that word up if it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden they are 
a tar it can be a fair target mm -hmm. for this kind of action. I mean, would, is that basically what the argument that you're trying to say is? I think it's fair in the public square. Yeah. The question is, is all fair? I don't know if that's the case, and that shouldn't be the case. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. All right. Uh, thank you for coming to the International Spy Museum. Yeah.